I'm currently wearing pajamas. I just thought I'd get that out of the way, but they're kind of smart. They've got a collar, so some might even call this business casual. Hello, welcome to Recovering Book Snob. My name is Chloe, thank you for joining me. I read 29 books this summer, and in this video I'm going to rank them. I'm a bit of a rambler, I get distracted in case you haven't noticed. So I'm gonna make an effort to do it as concisely as possible. I'm gonna try to describe each book as I go through it in three sentences each. And that's gonna be my challenge for today. Let's get started. It Starts With Us by Colleen Hoover. Nothing happens and I didn't really like the writing style. The book was a bit of a cash grab, to be honest, uh, but I don't blame Colleen Hoover. Um, it's the sequel to It Ends With Us, so, and that was really successful, so they were like, might as well do another. I've just failed at the three sentences thing. Okay, I'll try next time. Number 28, It Ends With Us by Colleen Hoover. This is a toxic relationship portrayed pretty well, but the writing style left me in agony and I'm glad it's over. Number 27, The Crying of Lot. 49. This is about a distressed and bored housewife who investigates a conspiracy theory to do with the postal system. It's extremely confusing uh, with glimmers of hope but overall it's not for me and I found it a bit jarring. Evidence of the Affair by Taylor Jenkins Reid. Wife writes letters to husband of woman her own husband is having an affair with. Pretty fun and juicy as per Taylor Jenkins read usual, but nothing to write home about. The Love Hypothesis by Ali Hazelwood at 25. Totally ludicrous fake dating trope. Aggressively PG until it really isn't, and is like reading a rom-com. So very easy read. Number 24 is People Person by Candice Carty Williams. This is about a man who's had loads of children, mostly with completely different women. Uh, the children are reunited in quite strange off-the-wall circumstances. Overall, I found all the characters very charming and I loved it in that sense, but I did get slightly lost towards the end. As in, not confused, more just stopped enjoying it as much towards the end. At number 23 we have Gabriel Garcia Marquez, The Sea of Lost Time. This is a short story essentially about a village surrounded by an increasingly unpredictable and difficult sea. Incredibly conceptually weird, um, but I still really enjoyed it. Uh, and my first experience with magical realism, uh, which is pretty cool in itself. Number 22, The Year of Magical Thinking by Joan Didion. This is a memoir about the time following the sudden death of her husband and the really bad illness of her daughter. The writing is so skilled and precise. I'm fangirling because it's one of my first experiences of Joan Didion. Um, but for a memoir about grief, it lacked emotion, which is fair enough, but I'm just saying, if you're looking for an emotive one, maybe stay clear of this. But still a pretty incredible book. Number 21, we have Yellow Face by R.F. Kwan, a highly, hotly, highly, hotly anticipated book. This is about an author who steals another author's manuscript and publishes it as her own after this author dies in front of her. It's dark humour, funny, very weird, horrifying actually, <laughs> if we're really thinking about it. Not quite as magical as I hoped it would be, considering the hype and also just considering the concept, which is really cool. We're now moving into the four star reads, which is pretty exciting. Um, at number 20, we have The Handmaid's Tale sequ sequel called The Testaments by Margaret Atwood. To be honest, it is a pretty disappointing sequel to The Handmaid's Tale, but we must realize that The Handmaid's Tale set the bar ludicrously high. We're gonna talk about it later in this list. It gives really welcome origin stories and backgrounds Though I have to say I listened to the audiobook version and some of the narrator's voices I really had to suffer through. Um, there's no other way of describing it. Carrie Soto is Back by Taylor Jenkins Reid. A player returns from retirement to defend her title and various... what are they called? Records. <laughs> 
some complex language in here, Chloe. This book is incredibly sentimental and engaging, and it also has the protagonist, Carrie, is incredibly abrasive and not necessarily that likeable. Um, which we love. We love an abrasive woman. The Mothers by Britt Bennett occupies number 18. Uh, this is about a woman who leaves her quite small hometown after a scandal and then comes back years later and it follows her and two friends. It's called The Mothers because The Mothers is this group of village elders. It's told from their point of view, um, so it's kind of gossipy, small town community vibes. And it's just really easy to get into, really easy read. Give it a go. The Seven Moons of Marley Almeida by Shehan Karunatalaka is a really brilliant story about a dead Sri Lankan photographer who tries to work out who killed him. Um, and he's in this weird in-between world and he's given seven days to do it and once the seven days are up he has to move on to the afterlife. It's entertaining with a very original point of view obviously and the characters are very funky. Um, some of them are a little bit thin but that's my only complaint. Overall, it's a great time. I mean thin, like, personality-wise, not physically. That would be strange of me. Number 16, we have Old Babes in the Wood by Margaret Atwood. This is a wonderful collection of short stories about grief and relationships, especially in later life. For that reason, I don't think I was the target audience for it, but I still got a lot out of it. And there were times when I'm getting used to essays. Like, sometimes I just don't really understand what's going on, but I'm happy and I'm enjoying the ride. And that's what matters. Another essay collection at number 15, we have The White Album by Joan Didion. This is a collection of essays about sort of current affairs, politics, and just life in 1960s California. It's incredibly captivating. It really feels like you're in conversation with a friend. Joan Didion's writing style is, it's really something. Uh, and even though, again, I didn't necessarily understand the context that well, because I'm not that up to date on US current affairs of that time, but I still managed to really enjoy it and get a lot out of it. People, Places and Things by Duncan Macmillan is a play about an actor who finds herself in rehab and is working on getting better and you kind of are working out how she got there. She's incredibly unlikable. We know I love a dislikable female protagonist, so that's great. I knew it would be a little bit emotive, but I was overall expecting a medium chill read and it actually did crush me, so take from that what you will. Number 13, we have a very enormous man with, no, a very old man with enormous wings, again by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. This is another short story and this is the one that first turned me on to this author about a man who arrives in a family's garden one night after a storm and he's got enormous wings um, and they kind of take him in and it's all about their response and the community's response to finding this kind of slightly random magical being. As you can imagine, it's totally bizarre and it's unlike anything I've ever read and full of metaphors, but really cool and really interesting. Number 12, we have Writers and Lovers by Lily King. This is a story about an aspiring writer navigating life in her kind of early 30s, um, soon after the death of her mother, the sudden death of her mother. What I really like about this book is that it's not really about grief, except it's kind of all about grief and that's the reality of grief. And it's just really chaotic and contradictory in the best way. Number 11, we have To The Lighthouse by Virginia Woolf. I cannot express how little happens in this book. It is about a family deciding whether or not to go to the lighthouse the next day. Seriously, that's all that it's about. It is a very detailed, challenging, but rewarding read all about the interior lives of people and how different people's realities are. We are now entering the top 10. Will This House Last Forever by Xanthi Barker. It's a memoir about processing the grief of a very absent father. She has this stunning voice. The writing is so raw and lacking in pretense and it's just really clever. You gotta read it. You gotta read it to understand what I'm talking about. Normal People by Sally Rooney. In case you don't know, this is about two people with massive communication issues who fall in love and it follows them through school to uni to after uni and through various mental health issues and family issues. Oh, my leg has gone numb. Come on Chloe, we can do it. This is one of those books where it really depends who you are um, as to what and what you're projecting onto it as to what this book is really about. For me it's about loneliness 
and fitting in. It's just really worth the hype. At number eight, we have June by Frank Herbert. Uh, this is my first ever sci-fi about people fighting over a precious spice on a mysterious and not very well understood desert planet. Do not read this if you value character development. That is my only gripe. Okay, let's get through this before my leg falls off. We are now into the five star reads that I read this summer. Prima Face by Susie Miller. This again is a play about a barrister who is usually in defense of people accused of sexual assault until she one day is sexually assaulted herself. It's very precise and emotive um, and it's written by a barrister. At number six, we have Educated by Tara Westover. This is an extraordinary memoir about a woman who leaves a survivalist Mormon family uh, to pursue a formal education. Brilliant memoirs, they just hit me right in the gut because I don't understand how people write about their own experiences so well. It is kind of painful to read, but it's just stunning. It's such an incredible book. Americana by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie is a book about a Nigerian woman who moves to the US to go to university there and stays there a little bit after uni but then eventually comes back to Nigeria. I just completely fell in love with the characters. Um, there's a lot to this book but there's a really lovely love story in it and it's also really interesting reading about all the cultural differences that she experienced and just various forms of racism. It's 500 pages but honestly it felt like 50. The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath. This is the ultimate sad girl book full of beautiful writing that is somehow flowery and whimsical but also really concise. I don't, I don't know how she does it, it's quite magical. I'm just really sad I didn't read it sooner to be honest. Young Mungo by Douglas Stewart occupies our third place. This is about a very young poor Glaswegian boy growing up and exploring his sexuality and falling in love. It's just a beautiful love story. Um, it's painful, but it's beautiful, and the writing is perfect. Crime and Punishment by Fodor Dostov Dostovsky is our second place book. Uh, the way to describe this, and it sounds ridiculous, but this is truly what it's about, is a man who kills an old woman for no real reason and spends the rest of the book spiraling. It's kind of a grind in the way that it was published in the 18 somethings, so it's just a very different style, it's a bit long-winded, like all the usual things that a classic has, but for whatever reason, it still felt sort of easy to read. I didn't get lost at any point, and I also just really appreciated it for the brilliant book that it is. It's also kind of funny, like it's, it's funny. Uh, somehow, it's kind of dark humour. Finally, at our top spot, and although this is top spot of my summer list, I do anticipate this book being in a kind of best reads of all time type place, because that's how much I loved it, is The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. This is about a dystopian future, near future, where fertility is really low, and so all the fertile women are kind of rounded up and then sold off um, and used as walking, talking wombs. And the book is told from the point of view of one of these women. This is just a perfect book. Every word is thought out and full of loads of meaning. Um, it's also just really tense, very gripping. Uh, I can't, you need to just read it. You need to read it because I can't get across how brilliant it is. Yeah, I don't know. The only thing I can say is that I'll probably think about this book once a week for the rest of my life. Okay, I think I did pretty well actually. I think that was actually a pretty good speed round from me. I'm so pleased with my summer reads. I have got such an eclectic mix because I've been really trying to branch out recently and reading the odd random book and it's so satisfying discovering something you like. Anyway, thank you for watching. Goodbye.